I'm excited to bring to you an overview of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, this video may be part of a larger series depending on how I feel and how it goes. I'm going to leave a link in the description to the book that I'm um, going to be discussing along with some information about the sections that I'm highlighting. If you've never read Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, it's a classic in philosophy and perhaps one of the most famous, if not the most famous, philosophy books ever written. It was meant to be an um, introduction to um, bringing self-consciousness to a proper philosophical point of view. Um, and in fact, according to Hegel, once one had read and internalized this content, one was then capable of discarding with it, um, not holding on to it forever, but um, but having moved through it, um, then reached a stage of philosophical consciousness, which then one could then go on and make further progress in analyzing phenomenology. Um, it's really a text focused on training um, phenomenologists and people who are capable of understanding the movement of, of self-consciousness in history. So, as you can see, it, on the screen here. Um, it was published in 1807. Um, and let's get into it. Let's try to understand the phenomenology of spirit. So let's start off with a general overview of what this book attempts to communicate to the reader. The first thing that we can highlight is that Hegel's interested in world spiritual stages of mental progress. And this, in some sense, is um, elucidated by, by dialecticizing a, a logical matrix of possibilities that past world spirit had taken in its realization and its actualization. Um, the form of world spirit as Hegel understood it in his time, uh, and came to think it in his time, and also from understanding this logical matrix, trying to elucidate possible future matri logical matrices of self-consciousness, um, although Hegel would never specifically discuss or jump ahead of his time, so to speak. He was just talking about um, a sort of possibility matrix for consciousness, and um, in this logical possibility matrix, he thought that the necessary path for um, human self-consciousness in history was to transition through uh, an immediate sensual um, experience uh, to a scientific philosophy. And this, of course, can be seen as a reflection of the time in which Hegel lived, um, given that he lived in a time where the spirit of science was, in some sense, the spirit of the age, and he was searching for a philosophy that could reach a level of spiritual objectivity. Um, but for Hegel, he thought that this transcended, this dialectic transcended um, uh, just the particular age, the contingent age in which he found himself. And that although self-consciousness um, was irreducibly um, existing within an environment that was contingent, it nonetheless developed along a trajectory which was ultimately um, a necessity. And that necessity was a type of objective knowledge. And... Um, in its search for objective knowledge throughout history, it had gone through certain, what for Hegel were logical stages of development. Now, um, in elucidating this path, he came to think that all pathways led to what he called absolute knowing or absolute knowledge. And absolute knowing or absolute knowledge, as we'll get into, was a state of being where um, 
there were no more um, external problems for idealization. That knowledge was that knowledge, the knowledge of the spirit was sufficient for the being um, of that spirit. Um, in some sense, you get this image of a a circle that closes in on itself. But at the same time, this, this closing in on itself is not the end in the sense that the spirit is now done and is no longer becoming, but closes in on itself in the sense that there's a new horizon. Um, it's almost like a logical level in which spirit can reach. And once spirit reaches this, we're in a, a new level of spirit. And um, this is sort of where Hegel leaves us. Um, in the phenomenology of spirit and, and, and asks us to contemplate how one goes from sensual immediacy to this, this sense of absolute knowing. Okay, so here you see two images, and I'm, I'm um, representing these two images because I think they're central to understanding um, Hegelian philosophy as a totality. Now, on the left, you see Hegel's necessity. And in order to understand this, un this, 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 this concept, you have to understand that um, we all start from totally different um, life positions. We're all born um, in different environments, different times, different places. And we all start with just a, um, a, we all start in a mode of, of very weak and, and unintegrated and disparate sensations. Um, see things, hear things, touch things, but nothing is yet, we're just in a, 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 a very raw present moment. And then as we progress upon our life paths, um, as you'll see see here represented, you'll just see all of these contingent life paths with which which turn and twist in different directions. Um, we come to get a sense of an inner coherence. We start to perceive the world as a as a type of um, a unified thing. Um, and he thought that in this process from sensual immediacy to a type of unified perception that the, the notion or the idea um, of a self-consciousness would eventually reach an understanding of itself which was one with its environment. Um, and then this would represent a type of um, absolute idea. And so that's uh, a nice segue into uh, the representation you see on the right of Hegel's absolute, which is simply this um, dialectical motion, this back and forth between knowledge, which is on our side of the equation, and being, which is on an external side of the equation. So you can think about this in a scientific way. Um, if you think about physics or biology or chemistry or, or geology, um, you have a certain, uh, you have the scientist, the spirit, um, which has a certain praxis, a certain set of knowledge, um, which is, of course, for us. So our, our abstractions, our, our physics knowledge, our chemistry knowledge, our biology knowledge, and then you have the being in itself, which would be the physics or the chemistry or the biology in itself. Now, Hegel was well aware that Kant had um, barred us from being in itself in the sense that our knowledge didn't get at what physics really was in itself or, or chemistry really was in itself. This was noumenal um, and we were barred from this um, according to Kant. But what Hegel uh, was interested in was that um, this being in itself was in fact something posited by knowledge for us. It's posited by the subject. And so this, this getting at something true, this getting at being in itself for Hegel was something actually 
coming from our spirit, something coming from us. And so once you dialecticize nature in Hegel's dialectic of, of nature, you reach this point where um, the knowledge for us and the being in itself is something that's being generated in history um, by the motion of, of spirit, by the motion of our ideas. And so Hegel was interested in this point where, in some sense, the idea and being or knowledge and being fit into it, fit into itself and we're, we're, we're in some sense rotating with itself. Um, and this was the notional determination of the spirit. Uh, so that gives you a good idea there of those two concepts, which are central for his, his understanding of history as a whole. So, this brings us to um, the difference for Hegel between the first order and the higher order, or might you might call it the second order. On the bottom, you'll see first order spirit as historical actors. So there you see all the different all the different life paths of spirit, um, starting in sensual immediacy and then and then developing through their perceptions and their understanding. Um, developing their logic in a loop with sensual immediacy, getting a deeper and deeper understanding of, of the world around them. And as you'll see, as the lines, as the, the different life paths are crossing and intersecting with each other, um, the bifurcations between a, the brown line and a red line are meant to represent oppositions, which we'll get into. Um, but they're type, types of logical disagreements of branching in different ways that spirit will spirit will develop a universal logical understanding which contradicts another spirit's universal logical understanding and um, for Hegel um, this was um, the situation for historical actors um, and historical actors didn't have a, a sophisticated phenomenological knowledge of what they were doing. Um, they were just acting on the on the first order in relationship to what they thought was being in itself, but they didn't understand the process as a whole of what was going on in relationship between knowledge and being. And for Hegel, this is where higher order commentary comes in, and this is for Hegel the role of a phenomenological analysis. That a phenomenological analysis would be able to go to a a type of um, bird's eye view perspective on the historical actors um, from a state of absolute knowledge, which would be not temporal, not realized, and not local, whereas historical actors would be temporal, realized, and local. The state of absolute knowledge would be atemporal, unrealized, and non-local. And you sort of view the oppositional determinations um, the disagreements between between consciousness, the way the logical forms were interacting, and then you could sort of see the way in which um, differences appear and the way in which they could be mediated. And this would be the role of the phenomenological analysis. Um, and so you see this this represented here, hopefully pretty pretty clearly. Now, um, in this relationship between the absolute idea and the, the temporal um, individuals, you have here a crucial notion of uh, Hegel's coincidence between the universal and the particular. So when we usually, and I feel like this is a really important idea, so usually when we think about the universal, we think about maybe the universe as a whole. We might think of the laws of physics as universal. Or we might think about the principles of evolution as universal. They apply everywhere in the universe, all space and time, say, um, all matter and energy, say. Now, um, that is a particular, what I suppose Hegel would say, a first order scientific understanding of the universal. But um, in Hegel's philosophy, everything is seen from the perspective of the idea and the becoming of the idea in, in history, which is a spiritual process. And that means for Hegel that there is a strange inversion of the universal where um, 
a particular spirit embodies the universal. So instead of thinking, and here's an example, instead of thinking about Isaac Newton's space-time as an absolute universal, we're asked to think about Isaac Newton himself as a historical spirit, a historical actor embodying universality. Um, and then Isaac Newton's spirit as a universal force and its impact on historical becoming, his spiritual becoming, say, the physics communities as a spiritual process. And this would be one manifestation of the absolute idea. But, of course, there are other manifestations of the absolute idea. So, for example, um, we might say that someone like James Clark Maxwell or, or, or Albert Einstein or um, Ed Witten uh, or Stephen Hawking, these are individual, particular individuals who embodied the universal. Um, and through embodying the universal, changed spiritual becoming, changed history. Um, so for Hegel, the universal is not so much um, some sort of first order external objectivity out there, but rather a spiritual objectivity of absolute knowing, which emerges in history um, through a notional mediation, which is a big difference in thinking. And this this move, this 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 move of of internalizing the universal through a particular, I don't think it's really been fully thought through, but I think it's a really powerful idea. Now, here you see um, what Hegel thought of as the dialectical horizon as a whole, how a phenomenological analysis could um, basically conceive the horizon of thought. And for Hegel, he would think that a, um, a thought phase in history could be thought of as a unified whole. So you might say that a, a political body like the United States of America would be a unified whole, or the physics community would be a unified whole, or... Um, uh, the Christian religion might be a unified whole. Any such um, thought phase for Hegel would be studied in its own objectivity. Um, and what he saw was that a unified whole from the phenomenal dialectician's perspective, perspective would in fact um, exist among the historical actors in a logical contradiction or opposition. So we could use the formula, and we'll continue to use it, the formula A equals B. And what that means is that you'll have logical side A and logical side B. And both logical sides are different manifestations of the same objective thought phase. So you might say, for example, in the United States of America, that you would have logical side A being liberal, democratic, progressive, and you might have logical side B being conservative, um, Republican, um, traditional. And these two logical sides both form um, parts, uh, uh, polarized parts of the whole. Um, but historical actors will um, embody as a universal their logical side and see the other logical side as getting in the way of the unity of the whole. They can't see that the unity of the whole is a contradiction. It is a contradiction of identity between the two. And so the job of the dialectician was be able to understand that, understand how these logical sides emerge and be able to, to mediate them in some sense. And this is what Hegel thought of as the notional movement of the world spirit. Um, and in terms of his identification of um, what was going on on a phenomenal level, he would refer to each logical side as a type of species of, re of reflection. Um, that these were different modalities of reflection which um, were a very part of the Absolute's revelation um, to itself. Okay, so now we're going to go deeper into the mechanics of this process and how a dialectician might um, use these logical 
um, understandings to make their own phenomenal analyses. So here you see, and now we introduce perhaps the central concept for Hegel, which is the negation. So as you can see on the bottom, um, on the bottom left, you have the A equals B logical side A, logical side B. You could use a political example like the United States. You could use a scientific example like the physics community. You could have um, uh, on the one hand people who study general relativity and you can have on the other side say people who study quantum mechanics as logically opposing um, thought structures which compose the physics community as a whole um, and they have different ways of approaching a grand unified theory which would reconcile the two and each of them see the other as in the way or, 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 or in some sense lacking. Um, now, what a phenomenal analysis would do would be able to go to the higher plane and sort of see the way in which these contradictory identities were manufacturing each other, um, the way in which these identities were creating each other in some sense and dependent on each other on a phenomenal dialectical level, even if as historical actors they had to embody one particular side. Um, but the dialectician would be able to go to this meta view, mediate the two, and then not, it's not that once this mediation had been complete that you get a um, total reconciliation, but if done properly, you would get a totally different thought horizon. Um, so you would have, in the political example, you might have a totally different field of political discourse, or in the physics example, you might have a totally different field of physical discourse. Um, and you could give many other examples for many different fields of human history. Um, now, this process, this going to the meta level and seeing both oppositions is, again, called um, the mechanism of negation. So you basically negate temporal historical identities as the historical actors are presenting them to you. Um, and instead of identifying strongly with one side, you locate the tension, the difference, the way they're opposing each other, um, the way in which these species emerged in reflection and their, their necessary relation to the other. Um, and so this is what um, Hegel thought was, the again, the job of the analyst. Now, in terms of the... Um, relation and the opposition and the difference between A and B, um, Hegel was um, quite observant to note that this was not a, sym a symmetrical duality. This was not, A equals B was not that A and B are just balanced opposites. Um, for Hegel, they were polarized in different directions and they took on different notional motions. And this is very important to understand politics and, and, and other fields of, of study. Um, so he thought that A, logical position A, emerged first and attempts to differentiate itself and become its own species of reflection. It attempts to become existing on its own as an indivisible unity which does not need B. B emerges second as a reaction to A, and it does not eliminate A, it counters A in the opposite direction. And so A and B point in different directions. Um, one, you could say a progressive motion, and the other a conservative motion. So you could say one tries to introduce the new, so like the emergence of the new out of the abyss of nothing, and then B in reaction to A, says, hold on, let's go back. And then they they just do this in their tension, in their antagonism, until the field is broken to another level, which would be C, which would be the job of the phenomenal analysis. Now, we can use these logical mechanics to... Um, logically deduce how one gets to what Hegel called absolute knowing. And we do this by trying to understand the sequence of the understanding itself. 
for Hegel, all of these species of reflection in their own unity um, were produced by a mechanism of the understanding. And what the understanding does for Hegel is it takes a divided sensual perceptual aspects and transforms them into a whole. So you might say when you start out as an infant, again, you have all these, these multiplicity of sensations, and then you might get a perception of the world, um, but then you don't have a unified understanding of the world. You don't have an understanding of the world the way Einstein or Newton or Darwin had an understanding of the world. Or even in the political sphere, um, when you're a conservative, um, or if you're a liberal, or if you're um, any, any species of reflection within that domain, you have a certain um, universal understanding of the world, which is held together by very complex relations of, of notions. Um, and so, um, again, if we look at the bottom and we move up through this, um, these logical mechanics to absolute knowledge, how we get there is first, you have A and B in an opposition to one another. So you have A who thinks it has the absolute knowledge, but B also has the absolute knowledge and it's contradictory. So you can't both have the absolute knowledge because one says he has the absolute knowledge, the other says he has the absolute knowledge, but they contradict each other. Think about, for example, the difference between Christians and, and Islamic people. Uh, they both say they have the absolute knowledge, but they're contradictory, so they can't both have the absolute knowledge, so there has to be some mediation of the two of them. Again, that's C. Um, or take, for example, the difference between spirit and science, spirituality and science, religion and science. Um, they both might uh, say that they have the way to 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 um, absolute knowledge or the or the right way of knowing, but they can't both be correct. So there has to be some mediation of the two. Um, now, of course, it's asymmetrical, so you have to identify which is species A and which is species B, so that you can understand sort of which species made the first cut, the first dividing moment, and which species made the conservative reaction to that dividing moment. Um, but once you've done that, um, or even, you know, whether or not you, you do that, um, you can move to the next level, which is the next level up, which is that you see that species B or species A, depending on which logical position you found yourself in, um, is in fact a lack internal to you. So in thinking that you embody universality, um, in thinking that you have an indivisible understanding, a holistic understanding, um, you necessarily produce a excess or a lack because you can't possibly understand the whole of reality. Um, and that other that you thought was in your way, in fact, was inside you and you have to understand your own contradiction. You have to understand your own contradictory identity. You have to understand the way your, the way your universal understanding is actually a temporal historical phenomenon. Um, and so then you have to really go down to the presuppositions of your worldview and, and challenge them fundamentally so that you can um, reach at real absolute knowledge for Hegel. So then once you've done that and you see that B is inside of you or A is inside of you, depending on where you were, then you can then, um, one, not concentrate so much on the lacking other, the other in your way, and you can eventually sort of develop a motion in yourself where you um, reach a type of stage where the knowledge you develop in your contingent historical landscape um, is sufficient for the being in your local, your local context. And this is where A would would where where the consciousness would reach A, the absolute. And then once you've reached A, the absolute, and you're internally coherent and consistent in yourself, then you have singularized yourself. And once you've singular singularized yourself, then you would reach a higher level of of becoming. So it's again, it's not that once you have absolute knowledge that you um, are done becoming. It's that you have reached a certain closure in the process of spirit 
spiritual understanding. And now we can speculate from a new horizon. Um, again, Hegel thought that once we understood this method, once we understood this dialectic, we could go to a higher level, um, which is still to be explored. Um, and that's why after Hegel, you have the emergence of a type of post Hegelian philosophy, which tries to think beyond this horizon, beyond absolute knowing. Um, now on, on the other side, you see this phenomenal process of understanding, and I have here denoted notional functions. Now what that means is that at each level of the, the logical process I took you through, we have a correlative notional function. So at the first stage where A and B are opposing to each other, we have this, the notional function of universality. So A thinks it has the universal understanding, B thinks it has the universal understanding, and they're both contradictory. Then on the second level, you have specificity where, um, or you might say individuality, where you, um, again, internalize that this opposite is inside of you and you're producing it in yourself. Uh, and that becomes the second notional function. And then the third notional function is singularity, where you become a type of, you develop an internal rotary motion with yourself between your knowledge and being, um, which is a pure singularity. Um, and that would be the level of the absolute for Hegel. So, in terms of, now we're going to get, as we come to the end, we're going to get into what Hegel's trying to articulate as the fundamental relation between epistemology and ontology, between subjectivity and the world. So, for Hegel, he would define subjectivity once it's reached this stage of singularity, as basically, again, it's not that universal is out there in the external world. It's that once we reach the level of the absolute, we become a self-active universal singularity. Um, and then in the ideal situation, and again, Hegel is an idealist, that world spirit in its actualized form, its fully actualized form, at least as far as we can know, um, would be a world spirit that would be a type of agora of conversation. This would be the highest level of mind where absolute spirit, sure of itself, in itself, as a self-active singularity, was interacting with other such singularities. Um, and then the entire space of discourse would be different. The entire space of understanding would be different. Um, because, of course, this agora of conversation in in uh, the becoming of world spirit at the different stages, the different phases of world spirit um, are undergoing all of these tensions and antagonisms between A and B, this, this, this logical oppositions between each other where there's constant uh, uh, fighting, but world spirit between absolute spirits would be a different uh, phase of spirit, um, if you like. Now, in terms of this understanding how um, the mechanics, the critical features of, of this, this spiritual objectivity reaching this absolute knowing is that um, the first thing that the subject does is distinguish and divide itself from otherness. Um, so you might think about the way in which um, young children um, and teenagers and, and, and young adults try to differentiate themselves. They try to be different. Um, from the people who came before them, from the generations that came before them, from everything else that exists, and they try to assert a different identity. Um, then once spirit has sort of distinguished itself, um, divided itself, and, and gotten a, a, a new sense of identity, which is its own for its own time, um, it tries to interpret and control what's in front of it objectively. Um, which means that it takes the raw, co uh, contingent, sensual immediacy of its time and approaches it with its own logical understanding and tries to develop itself objectively. It tries to become a objective spirit in the world. That could be anything, you know... Um, you know, from a philosopher to a scientist to a politician to a um, to uh, 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 any other of the many multiplicity of different things uh, that an, a human identity can become. 
And then the crucial thing is that for Hegel, he thought that um, self-realization or self-actualization was not this total letting go of your identity in this, in, in say a, a, a Buddhist sense, um, but rather by um, objectifying oneself, by by making one's environment one's own, and 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 making one's environment one's own in a radically individuated sense that you aren't copying or mimicking necessarily what came before you. You are con- through the through the raw contingency of the time that you're in, um, uh, generating the new. Um, and objectifying yourself in a way that's never been done before. So it's this interesting coincidence between pure novelty, pure subjectivity, pure spirituality, and and objectification. This true object, absolute objectification, and and um, this is this is for Hegel the, the 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 field of history that we're that we we find ourselves in. Now, um, on a final note for this for this introduction. You have an interesting and difficult to conceptualize relation between um, the absolute idea in itself and its realization within particular historical individuals. So you have this idea that there is a pre or proto notional shadow realm it's not like a platonic realm of a fully realized idea, like a perfect static fixed idea. It, it more, the way Hegel describes the absolute idea in itself sounds much more like a wave function. It sounds much more like a superposition. It sounds much more like a um, non-local, non-temporal, unrealized space of potentiality. Um, and this was the absolute idea in itself for Hegel. And this, this shadowy realm for Hegel precedes um, sense um, experience. It precedes natural objects. Sense experience and natural objects are its objectification. They're the objectification of this shadowy notional realm. Um, but at the same time, and this is the interesting thing where where Hegel's fully a, a philosopher of history and time and embodiment and spirit, is that in order for the absolute idea to receive its full realization and truth, it had to embody itself in a sensual, finite, local, particular body. Um, and this brings us to the motion between knowledge for us and being in itself. So um, in the end, when you fully internalize this, this dialectic, what Hegel thought was um, that it was through the the subject, through the spirit, that all of the universal patterns of nature and logic were activated, were realized um, in their contingent in their contingent history, um, and that um, each each stage of world spirit, each each becoming of the world spirit, was in some sense a detachment and a fall from the absolute idea in itself. The absolute idea in itself has no history, has no embodiment, has no 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 time. Um, in order to receive embodiment and time and 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 history and realization, it had to manifest in a subject in a subject. Um, and from that perspective, Hegel does not s- see a phenomenology of individualism along the lines of someone like Kierkegaard, and at the same time, he doesn't embody a phenomenology of an absolute idea like someone like Fichte or Plato, um, but rather uh, conceives of everything as the self-movement of particular, uh, I- uh, particular individuals who embody the absolute idea. And so it's this coincidence, again, between the universal and the particular, which is such a unique contribution to philosophy. Um, and m- maybe Hegel's, one of Hegel's central contributions to philosophy. And so that is a, um, a first attempt to start to unpack Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Um, if you like this, uh, if you enjoyed this lecture, let me know. Um, let me know in the comments. Um, Again, links in the description to the book I'm analyzing. 
um, with some some notes on on um, the sections I was was highlighting. Um, if you would like to see more um, of discussions of the phenomenology of spirit, um, again, let me know. And thank you so much to all of my Patreon supporters. Um, your support means so much to me, um, and it helps me to to know that I can continue to grow this channel in the future. So, thanks so much for watching. You can find links around my head to subscribe, to see my uh, Patreon channel, and to watch other content um, where I do commentaries on less than nothing and other philosophical works. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you again.